Now, Britannia at the Opera. Here's Roderick Dunnett. With a title like The Lily of Killarney, one might expect the composer of an Irish opera at least to have been born in the Emerald Isle, as indeed were Balfe and Wallace, whose operas we've heard over the last two weeks. But the real composer of Lily was not a native of these isles at all, at least not to start with. Julius Benedict was born in Germany in 1804, though he later moved to England, was knighted by Queen Victoria, and by his death at the age of 80 was seen as the very paradigm of Englishness. He'd shown great musical promise and studied with Mozart's pupil Hummel, met Beethoven, and was commended to Weber, with whom he studied in Dresden. Benedict arrived in London in 1835. Opera-wise, the time could not have been more apt, with the accession of the despised but resilient Alfred Bunn to the management of Covent Garden and Drury Lane. He conducted opera at the latter for a decade during its heyday, but it was at Covent Garden in February 1852 that the Lily of Killarney, Benedict's greatest London stage hit, first saw the light of day. He was blessed with two able librettists, John Oxenford and the colourful Irishman Dion Boussico, on whose play The Colleen Vaughan, or Blonde Lassie, the opera is based. And where mixed or conflicting emotions, and especially class difference, are concerned, there are some revealing insights. Waft away to the charming landscape of County Kerry, Imagine a silvery moon, the gentle lapping of waters, a mellifluous boatman, and a lovesick Irish laird. Oh, 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 oh,
That was our opera's lovelorn hero, Hardris Cregan, sung by the tenor Justin Lavender, as he prepares to rendezvous with his faithful retainer, the hunchbacked ferryman, Danny Mann, sung by Donald Maxwell. Hardris is a member of the landed gentry fallen on hard times, who without his family's knowledge has defied class rules and secretly wed his heart's desire, the fair Eileen, or Eile O'Connor, who is a mere commoner. Danny is now to row Hardris across the lake to visit Eile, but unknown to them, their wistful barcarolle is overheard. An unscrupulous creditor, Corrigan, sung by Brian Bannatyne Scott, threatens to reclaim his mortgage on Tor Cregan, the Cregan's family estate, unless Hardris marries a rich local heiress and settles the debt. Should he refuse, Corrigan threatens forcibly to marry Hardris's widowed mother, sung here by Francis McCafferty. But for now, Hardris can only yearn for his girl across the water. As we can hear, He's smitten.
to do. Once over the lake, Hardris and Ailea are reunited, but he now begs her to release him from their wedding vows, and out of love for him, she agrees. Enter Miles, a conscientious outlawed lad who also loves Ailea, and Father Tom, the kindly priest who watches over her. Together they insist that the marriage should stand. Poor Ailea, sung by Gillian Webster, is torn as Hardris accuses her of falseness and threatens to leave her anyway, the cad. This four-way argument builds to two terrific topsy climaxes before Hardress's angry exit closes Act One. The lowest well we cannot part, whatever may be fall. Though perils may assail my heart, it will surmount them all. A flameless pure may soon expire when breezes rudely blow. My love is fed by deathless fire, and through the storm can blow. What is love we cannot part, whatever may be known? Yet I will trust my heart, and give it my love. And in the very soul it's full, and the Oh, no. 
In that quartet, Miles was sung by Jamie McDougall and The Priest by Brian Bannatyne Scott. Act two introduces us to Anne Chute, sung here by Patricia Barden. She's the richest landowner in Kerry and seeks to wed Hardris herself and thus incidentally relieve his estate of debt. But she senses that her prospective fiancé's affections lie elsewhere and taxes Hardris with a succulent aria. Hardris admits to Anne that he still loves Eily, and Anne nobly concedes that she'd rather know the truth than dwell in misguided hope. Hardris returns home, only to find the sinister creditor, Corrigan, with his mother. How dare this presumptuous upstart proposition his mother? Mrs. Cregan begs her son to marry Anne before the two men swap insults and go their separate ways. Danny Mann now makes a most irregular proposal. If Eilie won't agree to return the marriage certificate, Hardris has only to send him a glove as a signal and he will bump her off. Hardris is horrified and declines. But the misguided Danny now takes matters into his own hands. He visits Mrs. Cregan and elicits from her unwittingly the crucial glove. Danny can now save his master. Mrs. Cregan will save the estate and together they launch into a parting song of triumph. Love and love would be 
a token as plain as anyone has spoken, and love would be a token as plain as any word has spoken.
Danny now has the glove, but he's known Eileen since she was a child. Can he really destroy her? However, duty to his master overrides all else. His mind is made up, he will do the dread deed. Danny the loyal retainer has become a force of darkness. Dr. Jekyll is now Mr. Hyde. Oh, 
I can. Unaware that her life is in danger, Eileen is home alone. With Hardress now gone, she sings of her loneliness, an ordeal, one suspects, in which she is by now well practised.
A wonderful aria, delightfully scored, which for all its Irish charm and lilting melody still reveals Benedict's Germanic origins. Danny enters, drunk, and promises to row Eilie across to meet her lover. Just what she's been waiting for, though the poor girl can't resist a quick, are you sure you're fit to drive? Miles, however, senses danger and warns Eilie against Danny Mann. She simply can't believe him and rises to a sensational top D in the hunchback's defence. Fatally, she embarks. I give to you, me dear, the best advice I can In bidding you beware, beware of Danny Man I'm warning you, me dear, beware of Danny Man I give the best advice, the best advice I can In bidding you beware, beware of Danny Man In bidding you beware, beware, beware Beware, beware of Danny Man That poor deformed, afflicted creature Crooked back, my dear, don't tell one's nature. Afraid of hardness ever But yet he may be false to you. I give to you, me dear, oh, the best of parts I can. In bidding you be well, be well of daddy, man. In bidding you be well, be well. I give the best advice, the best advice I can. In bidding you beware, beware of Danny Man. Beware, beware of Danny Man. Beware, 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 beware of Danny Man. Beware, 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 beware of Danny Man. I place this in the cell, allowed to creep in cellarly about. The quantum brain was mischief brewing, which very soon.
Well, we can't say she wasn't warned. Danny takes Eily by an unexpected detour to a deserted island cave and now demands the marriage certificate. When Eily protests, Danny hurls her into the water. At that split second, a shot rings out, but it's Danny who topples lifeless into the lake. It turns out that Miles uses the island for hunting and has conveniently mistaken Danny for an otter. I'm sure it happens all the time in these parts. A rogue is removed, the lass saved from drowning, and all in the nick of time. For her own protection, Miles conceals Eily in his house, and she is presumed dead by all. In Act 3, Anne and Hardress are preparing to wed. But he still can't get Eily out of his mind, and Benedict serves up another winner. If any German ballad deserved a British knighthood, surely this one did. <laughs> Yeah. 
So, Hardris really does love Eile after all. But suddenly, soldiers appear at the door. Rumour has it that Hardris is responsible for Eile's disappearance. Flea screams his mother, and wisely he follows her advice. Only the virtuous Miles can put wrongs to right. He duly produces the girl, and Hardris is cleared. Not even a whiff of a manslaughter charge for Miles, or indeed the otter who got away. Anne graciously forgoes her man and pays off his mortgage. She would like to meet her. The incorrigible Corrigan gets his cash, and amid general rejoicing, they all go off to live happily ever after. In this BBC studio recording of highlights from The Lily of Killarney by Sir Julius Benedict, Justin Lavender sang the role of Hardress Cregan and Francis McCafferty, Mrs Cregan. The parts of Corrigan and Father Tom were sung by Brian Bannatyne Scott and Miles by Jamie McDougall. Donald Maxwell sang Danny Mann, Patricia Barden and Shoot, and Gillian Webster the part of Eileen O'Connor with the BBC Concert Orchestra conducted by Barry Wordsworth. So farewell to the Lily of Killarney, our Irish opera by a German-born composer. Next week we shall be returning the compliment, an opera set in Germany by a British composer, Raymond and Agnes by Edward Loder. <laughs>